Before I introduce tonight's speaker, a quick word about future programs. Our speaker for June 2nd will be Marmy Fiedler. Her topic will be grave markers and headstones and what you can learn from wandering through a graveyard. All the little markers and things, they all have a particular uh, meaning. Then on July the 7th, Melissa Scroggins will be returning and she is working on a brand new program. We may be the first group to hear it. It will be on the 1950 census. And lastly, as I just mentioned, we have on the back table, we have a sign up sheet for anyone willing to provide some after meeting treats. You're welcome to sign up for any month that is not already a, a signee. Uh, so we would appreciate someone that would like to uh, either make them yourself from scratch or if you bring them from a bakery, hey, we're not going to complain. <laughs> Our uh, speaker tonight joins us from her home in Coarse Gold, California. Jamie Mayhew has been a genealogical researcher for over 35 years and in 2010 started the research service, California Cousins, Family History Research and Education. Jamie is a member of many genealogical societies, including the National Gene Genealogical Society, Southern California, Fresno County, Utah, New England Historic, Alabama, Georgia, and Ohio Genealogical Societies. And she has um, 24 years experience in education as a teacher and administrator. Jeannie has, uh, Jamie has provided us some handouts and they're available at the front of the table if you have not yet picked one up. And if you would like to have one as a PDF form, uh, make sure that I get your email address after the meeting and we can send it to you. So now via Zoom, with her program, it's time that you started using timelines to organize your research. Jamie Mayhew. Well, thank you very much. And it's been such fun listening to the chitter chatter in the background. Uh, you know, it's been so long since we've met in person for doing things like this. And so it's exciting to be here talking with you while you are all there. So if I were there, I would be asking you to raise your hand if you've ever used timelines. And I think probably the majority of you have created a timeline, but I'm hoping that this presentation will give you some ideas of things you could do with that timeline to uh, improve its use in your research. So what are timelines? Well, they're graphic visualization and organizational tools. We're all familiar with them. They show things in chronological order. They allow you to structure, analyze, and add content. Usually, if you're using either Excel or Word or any program, you can add to your timeline as you find information. It gives you per people, places, and events. So why should you use a timeline? Well, first of all, it helps you know your family better. It helps you to identify gaps in the timeline. You may think you know everything and you've got all the records and you create a timeline and you find that you're missing 10 years. What did they do? They were in one country in a, a census and 10 years later, they are in another county. When did they move? What things were changed that you might not even be aware of? It helps you to determine that you're missing records. What things are not in your timeline that should be? It helps you to analyze and correlate the information that you have and then resolve conflicts and contradictory data. We know that one person cannot be in two places at the same time. So if your individual is at one, one place and then he shows up someplace else at the exact same time, 
then you know that you may have put two individuals together that did not belong together. It helps you manage large amounts of information to organize them so that you know what you're looking at. And it also can help you integrate historical events and follow migration routes. So there's a lot of reasons to use timelines. How do you create them? Well, first of all, there's, you're, we're gonna look a minute at the desktop genealogy software and most of them create a timeline automatically. You can also see them in online programs such as Ancestry or Family Search. There is timeline creation software and I'll talk about those a little bit, but the easiest thing to do is to use a word processing program like Word or Google Docs or Pages or a spreadsheet program like Excel or Numbers or Google Sheets. This is my Roots Magic uh, timeline. I have a, I use Roots Magic and this is just the main page. And this is for my great grandfather, John Milton Orr. And you can see that it just has some general information on it. it. It's nice to get a good general idea, but it's not very specific. It also, you'll see, shows that he was born in two different years that were five years apart. And that's something that needs to be determined and probably the two and the seven in different uh, pieces of documentation are transfigured. One of them is correct. This is their actual timeline uh, tab. And you can see that it added a few more information. It shows the births of his siblings and his spouse's birth and his marriage of the different siblings. So this gives you a little bit more information, but again, it's very basic. Ancestry, when you create an ancestry uh, I'm trying to, it's called having a senior moment. When you enter a, a person into uh, ancestry and create a pedigree, there is a life story and they add things to it that they think you might be interested in. This is about Augustus Herod Lee. And you can see that it's, they've highlighted a few cities in their maps where he had uh, events. And they've put in a little bit of local information because in that area, cotton was a, uh, a big um, issue. So Ancestry has basic facts on their facts page. And you can see where chronologically you get the information about Nathan Peoples Lee just from what you've entered that's attached to sources. Family Search also has a timeline, and theirs is uh, similar to all of the others. But one of the advantages that you'll see here is the record hint. This is Helen Rebecca Orr, and she married James Arm, um, Armsteel May. And there is a hint that they are in the 1920 census, and that's not currently attached in Family Search. So. This is a timeline. All right, moving to com commercial timeline software. I want you to think about when you just look at something such as on family search or on ancestry, you don't learn as much as when you enter it. And there are programs, this one is called ourtimelines.com. And it allows you to create a timeline that you can learn and you enter in information about a person in their software and it generates a timeline. One of the most important things to think about in doing a timeline is what's going on at the time 
that your individual is doing things. And Google is your friend to find all kinds of things. This, I just uh, was looking at Sumter County, Georgia, and I Googled Sumter County, Georgia timeline, and this came up. And it gives me information, specific information about things that were happening in Americas and Sumter County in Georgia. I also found a website called gendisasters.com. And this helps you to find maybe events that touch the lives of your ancestors. One that touched the lives of some of my ancestors was the New Madrid, Missouri earthquakes that took place in 1811 to 1812. And these were massive earthquakes in the center of the United States that affected my ancestors who lived in that area. Here is a Texas timeline. I just, there again, Googled Texas timeline and the Bullock Museum has a Texas history timeline uh, of the Buffalo Soldiers. So lots of places you can find the time, timelines that tell you what was happening in that area that you're researching. Wikipedia is another uh, source for timeline information. I live in Coarse Gold. Coarse Gold is near Fresno. If I, I just did a, a search on Wikipedia for timeline of Fresno, California, and this is what I got. So I could add cultural information from all of these things. Look at this one. It's a timeline of Fresno, California facts for kids. And maybe not as, as detailed as the other one, but might be exactly what you need. I like this one. This was just a flyer that came up when I searched for Oakhurst timeline. And it gives uh, the historical information for this little city of Oakers that's just above me. Cindy's list will also give you more information to add to your timelines. And it will give you general history resources. Nandy, Nancy Hendrickson wrote a little book that's called The Genealogist U.S. History Pocket Reference. And it gives uh, quick facts and timelines of American history to help you understand your ancestors. So let's look at a few examples of what you can do with a timeline. A simple timeline for August Ignatz Hopp is just written in Word and it gives just things that were happening to him during his lifetime. Not too useful, but it's still a timeline. When I take the information, and this is for Perry Ross Eaglebarger, who is also an ancestor of mine, when I put it together, I can uh, create a timeline. I'll make it a little bit bigger. Here it is, and you can see it a little better. Across the top, I have the year. Now this is important, this particular timeline is done in Excel. And Excel has a lot of trouble handling dates that are before 1900. So since most of the things that I do are in the 17 and 1800s, I usually create a column for year. And then I put the date in its own column so I can sort by year. And the next column here is the event. And this one has US censuses, it has his birth, it has the 1870 and the 1880 census, and then his marriage and the birth of his first child. The location tells me that he started off in Missouri, but by between 1870 and 1880, 
he'd moved to Texas. Then he was in a different county in Texas when he got married and he stayed there when he had his first child. The source, you have a couple ways and you'll see a couple ways where I've entered a source and you should always enter a source. You can put in an actual uh, source notation and some of these you'll see have that. But one of the things that happens when you do that is it takes up a lot of space. So in this case, I numbered the sources and you'll see one of them shows up at the bottom of this page. And so I just numbered them and that's how you can tell where their sources are. And then in their notes, I put in the general information. Lots of different things could be in here, but for census, it has some information that leads me to some questions. The first one shows that F.G. Eaglebarger was a farmer and had $375 worth of personal property. And in 1880, he's still listed as being a farmer. So this leads me to some questions, one of which is both 1870 and 1880 had agricultural censuses. And my ancestor might be in the agricultural census. I also would wonder where was he between 1870 and 1880? When did they get from Missouri to Texas? Why did they move? So the agricultural census for 1870 is accessible on Missouri archives. And then the 1880 is also there. And as I said, I'm wondering, when did they leave Missouri? When did they get to Texas? Were they any place in between those two census uh, enumerations? This is a timeline in Excel again for August Ignatz Hopp. I mentioned him before. You can see that in the notes, I wrote some uh, analysis. His brother, Charles Hopp, died in 1868, and he was only 20 years old. That's very young for a death. What was going on in 1868? Hmm. I would want to check and see if maybe brother Charles Hopp was in the uh, the uh, Civil War, and maybe there was maybe he was injured. Maybe that's why he died just a few years later after that war was over. So, also down at the bottom here, you'll see that their mother Susanna Harst and father. Carl Heinrich Julius George Hopp died within November, December, January, February, four months of each other. That's kind of surprising. And they were pretty young. She was 46 and he was 55. Well, I had some questions. How old was August when each of these things happened? What about that civil war? How did that affect this family? What about Reconstruction? Well, let's make a timeline for New Orleans. There are lots of places you can get information about timelines. One of them is just by Googling Timeline New Orleans, and I got this timeline. I also found a timeline in Wikipedia, and this one is from Family Search. So lots of information about timelines, and I created this timeline. In 1812, Louisiana was admitted to the Union with New Orleans as its capital. In 1853, it suffered the worst epidemic of, of yellow fever that killed approximately 9,000 people. In 1861, it secedes from the Union, and the Confederate forces fire on Fort Sumter 
in South Carolina and civil war breaks out by April. In, on April 28th, the, a Union naval fleet captured New Orleans and the Union forces controlled all of New, York, New Orleans until the end of the Civil War. So that's very early in the Civil War, just the second year of the Civil War. Reconstruction approves a constitution that extends voting rights to black males and integrates public schools and public accommodations in 1868. And then in June, it is, Louisiana is readmitted to the Union. And in 1874, the federal government declares martial law. There was a lot of problems going on and they stayed in New Orleans until 1877. So let's take this information and combine it with the original spreadsheet that I created. So you'll see here that August was born in 1850. And he and his family survived that uh, epidemic of yellow fever. So he, he, was, they, he lived through that. He was only three years old because I added that column because we wanted to know what age he was at each of these events. And I created, I uh, joined these merged these cells together and I used color to show the things that were happening, the cultural events and things that were going on interspersed with the events that were specific to this family. So in the 1860 census, before the Civil War, they were in New Orleans in Ward 5. I might have wanted to put who was in the family and other information over here in the notes, it would make this very big, so I didn't in this case. And here are the events that happened during the Civil War. Now, during this time, August was between 10 years old and 14 years old when his city was under control of the Union Army. After the Civil War ended, only three years later, his brother, Charles Hawk, died, and he was only 20 years old. Then Louisiana is readmitted to the Union, and then we have another census. And by now, August is a bartender. The federal government declared martial law in 1874 in New Orleans, and during that time period, you'll see that he had, he did several things. He married his wife, Louisa Marie Ernst. His mother, Susanna Harst, died on November 25th and February 19th, his father died. She was 46 and he was 55. This is organizing the information that I have. Oops, I went backwards there. All right, there you can see it again. And then by 1878, his very first son is born and given his name. And, but only a year later, at the age of 28, August Ignatz Hopp Sr. dies. So why did August die so young? Was it an accident or an illness? How did his brother Charles Hopp die? Was it because of the Civil War? His mother and father died within three months of each other. Why did they die? Those are important questions that came about not from looking at individual pieces of data, but by correlating them in a timeline. So, I've added a little bit more to this timeline in Excel. Over here on the right, you'll see links. And these are links to uh, actual records. And this one down here is for his mother, 
Her name was, uh, let's see, let's look at this. It says Jacob Reint, a, a native of Germany, residing at number 193 North Louis Street in this city, who hereby declares that Mrs. Susanna Hopp, a native of Prussia, aged 49 years, died on the 25th inst, which means that month, which would be November 25th. They even wrote that and then wrote the date, November 25th, 1876. Um, at 10 o'clock at that two, uh, at 212 uh, South Louis Street in this city, cause of death, chronic diarrhea. Now, I could not find a record of his father dying, but I have a feeling they both died of the same thing. Don't you just love this handwriting? Isn't this really fancy? Very German. So another thing that I do when I make timelines, I like to use color. This is a timeline for the Mayhew family. And it is a timeline of some deeds. And I specifically only, I brought out the deeds. In this case, I made a very long timeline and it's written in word. It's not a, in, in uh, um, Excel, it's in word. And I separated out just some of the deeds. Now, first, there is a William Mayhew. William Mayhew is Abijah Mayhew's father. And he bought land from jo uh, Josiah Tilson. And I put the red or maroon purple around the names that are not part of this family I'm researching. So Josiah Til Tilson he was from the county of Cumberland in the state of Massachusetts. Now, this is actually Maine today because Massachusetts was part of, uh, I'm sorry, Maine was part of Massachusetts. So the records were in Massachusetts records. He bought, he sold for 125 pounds land to William Mayhew not spelled the way we spell it today. And we frequently find people who say, well, that's not my person because it's not spelled correctly. Well, that's how it sounds. And that's how the person who wrote this down, you know, spelled it. And it is our ancestor. In green, I have the description of the land and there are several people who are listed and I've done all of the people in small caps. I've bolded all of them and I've used color. If I were printing this in uh, black and white, it would still show up as unique where we could find this land purchase. And so there are some fan people here, John Buck, the first, third and John Buck the second, must be a John Buck the first somewhere, jo Job Prince, and this land is all bounding uh, by these people. And I wrote this in the notes. The bottom three all pertain to the same purchase. These were, this was land that David Gurney bought, um, bought land from Abijah Mayhew in Abington, Plymouth, Massachusetts. And he bought it for $700. And there is a description in green. And there's kind of an important part down here that tells you things. It says, with a privilege of water at the pump, he paying one half of the expense of keeping the same in order so long as he shall use the same and say, said Gurney the other half 
so long as he shall use the same. So let's, that's January 18th, 1849. In November, I'm going to make this bigger. In November, he, um, Abijah and his wife, Lucretia, sell this land to Eli Blanchard Jr. And the, the Eli Blanchard Jr. buys the same description. And it says here at the end, with all the privileges of the pump on the same condition as I have from David Gurney. And there are two witnesses, Jared Whitman and August V. Erskine. Well, from someplace else, I know that Lucretia J. Mayhew, her maiden name was Lucretia Jane Erskine. So this is one of her ref, uh, uh, relatives, and this is the same property as the property above. That same day, Eli Blanchard borrows $503.59 from Abijah, putting up that same property as collateral. So this is the kind of information that you can get from using a timeline. This is a comparative lifetime. And I create these sometimes because I want to find out who was alive at the same time. Let's start at the bottom. You'll see these are the children, and there were four of them. My ancestor, Ida Ruth Eaglebarger, died very young, and she lived from 1896, she was the youngest, to 1927. And above her, you'll see that her three siblings lived much lo longer into the 1900s. Their parents or their father was pro uh, Perry Ross Eaglebark. Now Perry Ross was born in Missouri and he died in Arkansas. But in between, he moved to Texas and he was married three times. Sarah Delitha Caldwell, was the wife who he had children with. And there are three children, the three children, or other, the four children below were all her children. And she died in 1910. And you can see that her children were, were fairly young. Her youngest child was about 15 when she died. And then they had stepmothers. Nora Virginia Steed, there must have been some problems because she lived quite a long time, but she and uh, Perry Ross Eaglebarger were divorced. And then he married Elmira Graves. Now, Elmira Graves did not have any children with Perry Ross Eaglebarger, but she was alive for a long time. She was even alive when Ida Ruth was, was alive. And so they, th she knew the three daughters of uh, her three stepdaughters. So let's look back a, a, a generation. Uh, uh, Perry Ross Eaglebarger's parents were Frederick G. and Nancy Jane McCormick. If you look at their timelines, you'll see that the grandchildren hardly knew those people. Um, they, for Ida Ruth, she was born after both of her grandparents died. And the other three daughters were fairly young when their grandparents died. And their great grandparents, which are the, the uh, top rows, they didn't know them at all. In fact, Perry Ross Eaglebarger did not know 
his grandparents because all four of his grandparents died before he was born. So this gives you an idea of, uh, and more could have been put onto this uh, timeline. And I would, now that I look at it, I would have put in when they got married, but I didn't. But I can add it because that's one thing about a timeline is it's a living document. And as you find information, you add it to what you have. All right, so what effect did the Civil War have on this family? Looking at them again, when did the Civil War take place? Well, the 1800s are written across the top. So the great, great grandparents were all dead by the time the Civil War started. The parents were alive and Perry Ross Eaglebarger was a little baby. He was born at the very beginning of the Civil War. And his children were all born after the Civil War was over. So what effect did it have on this family? I'd need to create a locality timeline to find out what was happening at the time that uh, this family was in Missouri. When and why did they move from Missouri to Texas? Why did they move? And, and at what point did they move with other people? We might want to look at some uh, land records to see if they owned land, which they did in Missouri, and they also bought land in Texas. So if I created a timeline and included that, I might know the exact times they moved from Missouri to Texas. The second wife and the eldest daughter both moved to California. Is there a relationship? Were they close? Did they live close to each other in California? Those are things I'd want to, redo, to research. And Ida Ruth was only 14 when her mother died. Did she go live with her older sisters? Where did she live? Or with her stepmother? So, when you're looking at a timeline, you want to analyze the gaps in the timeline. You want to see whether or not there, what was going on, were those, time, those gaps significant, and what could you, how could you find out uh, what, what was happening at that time? The censuses make a really good backbone for a timeline. You can, you've got 10 years apart and you can place them every 10 years, but that's not all that you need. You need to add historical events to your timeline. And I showed you some places where you could find out what was going on at the time that your families lived in the area they were in. You need to ask questions based on the information you see. What could, records could you look for to find the answers to those questions? You need to look at changes in county boundaries. Sometimes, such as my uh, timeline of the family who started off in Maine, where it was not Maine at the time, it was the District of Maine, which was part of Massachusetts and records can be found in Massachusetts. You can find these things in county histories. You need to look at the changes in laws in the, at the state and federal level. If you're lucky enough to be in an area that collected taxes or poll taxes, you might find that a person paid a poll tax. Well, if you look at the law, usually they had to be 21 to pay a poll tax. Therefore, you can guess what, when they were born or estimate, guesstimate when the person was born. Important events, such as those earthquakes in New Madrid, uh, Madrid, New Madrid, Madrid, I'm not even pronouncing it right, in Missouri. 
were there wars going on and how did they affect your families? Maybe there were fires that caused them to move. Maybe there were floods. Maybe there were hurricanes, tornadoes, or earthquakes that all were push factors for them to move somewhere else. Always include a citation where you got your information. You saw some of the timelines where I included the citation in a column. One thing you can do, as long as you're not trying to print them out, is with Excel, you can make your timeline as wide as you want. But with Word, you can turn it sideways. You can make it with different size paper and you can create, you can add more things to more columns to your timeline. But you wanna make sure you have a citation where you got your information, either citations at the bottoms of the timelines or on each, uh, as each line. Use color to visually add information. Helps you tell who are the main characters, who are, the, are part of the fan club. Where, when did they change from one area to another? You can color code them by where they uh, were living at the time. Lots of things you can do. And one of the things that I do with my timelines is I sometimes recreate them. I take a timeline I've already created and I pull out information and I add color because I want to evaluate the information I have on my timeline. Be careful how you enter dates. If you put in a date like uh, 08, 10, uh, 1853, Excel does not recognize dates prior to 1900 and it will not handle that kind of a date correctly. And you're gonna want to separate out the dates. One way you can do that also is to put the year first, say it's 1867 and then put the month and the day. Enter spelling exactly as it is in the record. You'll find that this helps you see how names were changed in their spelling. Sometimes it was just a matter of the person didn't know how to spell their own name and the person who wrote it down just wrote it how they thought it sounded like. Sometimes they did change the way they spelled it. My Eagle Bargers became, um, I'm sorry, my Eichelbergers became Eagle Bargers. And not too positive why they did that. It is somewhat more anglicized, but isn't a whole lot easier to work with. Online programs can create the timelines that include events tied to a source. And even though you're gonna get more out of creating your own timeline, it's to your advantage to take a look at the timelines that Ancestry and Family Search and uh, programs like that create so that you can get some ideas of where you should research. But all you really need is a word processor or a spreadsheet. It's really easy to do. Thank you very much. And I'd like to now open it up to questions. Thank you, Jamie. <laughs> Go ahead and face. So if you all want to do it like last time, if you have a question, feel free to ask. And if Jamie has any issues here, I'm happy to re uh, repeat it a little closer to the computer here. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing and then I get to be a little bigger. <laughs> I was just that little teeny picture over the side. So now at least you can see me and I can see you. Hi, ladies and gentlemen. We have a question here. Hi. Technology type of question. How do you create, how do you uh, increase the size of a cell in Excel so that you can keep adding in the same cell? 
uh, mind just jump to the next line. How do I all right. First of all, when you're using Excel, on the left-hand side, you'll see there's always a row of numbers. And those line numbers have a little line between them. And you can drag that line number to make it a little bit bigger. Now, the big thing you have to do is to stay within the cell. And if you just press the return key, you're gonna go to the next cell. So you're gonna wanna uh, press the option, well, I'm using a Mac and it's the option return, but on a PC, you can look it up and it will tell you what, the, what you would use to stay within the cell. And sometimes I will um, merge a whole group of cells together horizontally to write notes about a group of records that I have over on the left-hand side. But I do like using Word because you it, it sometimes is easier than, than doing that crazy technology stuff. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? How many, now that I can see, how many of you have done your own timeline? Have created? Okay, a few of you. A few of you haven't. And I'm hoping that after today, you'll try taking one of your brick walls and create a timeline and look at it and see what it is that you're missing. You saw that I used um, a lot of, of uh, land records. Now, land records aren't going to be on Family Search or uh, you, well, I found them on Family Search, but they don't attach the same way to a timeline on Family Search or on your uh, ancestry. So you don't get that information. And so actually writing it out yourself is what's going to help you to see and to find the questions that you need answers to solve your problems. Do we have any other questions? How do you do that? Um, find it yourself. Do you go to county records? Did you hear that, Jamie? Yes, I did. Okay, wonderful. And, all right. I use Family Search a lot because of the fact that it has information that is um, not easily found just by doing a general search. Most of us go in, we enter in the names of our person and something comes up. Lots of different things come up. But land records are usually not part of them. There is in Family Search, you can go into their catalog and look at the uh, area that you're looking for. So I'm looking at Cumberland, Maine. I would look, I would search for Cumberland, Maine because land records are usually kept at the county level. And as you look through there, you will see where it, it has land records. It'll have a section for land records. And when you go to that, it's going to be a film. It's going to be a digitized film. It's like you were going to a, the Family History Center in Salt Lake or someplace that, where they used to have the films. They now have, and you use a, a film reader. Now they have it digitized. Almost everything is digitized that was in the uh, vault in Salt Lake City. And you use that, you look at that. And the ones that I looked at, had a volume that was indexed. So I started off looking at the index. Um, Plymouth, um, Massachusetts was where those three that were together were from Plymouth, Massachusetts. So I looked at Plymouth County, Massachusetts. I looked for uh, land records. There were a series of 
can I show, can I share my screen and show you this? Would that be better? For, I mean, at this point, I think you're going to have a little problems understanding what I am saying. So if you give me just a second, let's just a minute. Let's open up this one and go to family search and I'm going to sign in. All right. And let's share this one. Just a minute. All right. I'm going to share my screen. There it is. All right, you should now be seeing me on Family Search. When I went to search, I go to catalog. And in the catalog, I'm looking for something that's in Massachusetts. And it's in Plymouth. And Here's Plymouth, Massachusetts. This gives you a catalog. And here's land and property maps. And I like this land and property here. And as I go down, you can tell I've already been there. This is deed records. And I was actually at the, uh, the library. I mean, I was at the um, the courthouse when I did this. And I can see here they're only available on uh, with film uh, reels, but they, microfilm reels, I can't actually look at them here. But you can see that there were index grantee and grantor. Remember, grantee is the, uh, the um, grantor is the seller and grantee is the buyer and it's alphabetical in groupings, and you'd look up the, uh, whatever the name you wanted, you'll find a whole bunch of different records, and then it will tell you which deed volume you want to look at. Some of them are like this, and this one actually allows me to search. Oh, well, I love that. Just, just what we need. There it is. This one allows, okay, it's gonna keep giving me a hard time. Lots of people. Here I am again, let's find Plymouth. Oh, they have digitized them. So if I'm looking for someone here, I just click on this and on this, this is just like the film. And when I go to the, you can see they, this is the index of deed records, volumes A and B from 1685 to 1801, and it's alphabetical. So when I look at the very first page, it says there's, oh, see, it's an old volume. Here is somebody whose name was Abs and Anna. Anna Abs bought some property from Joseph, I think that's Connor, and it's in volume 72, page 43. And you'll see that it groups them by name. Once you have that information, you go back here and you find the volume that you need, and then you look for the page. Does that make sense how you could find that? Go home and try it for a county that you're looking at. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I, I do a lot of talks on land records because they aren't as easy to find, but you sure can find out where the people were. And it's a good way to fill in that information in your timeline. Do we have any other questions? I know you have a meeting coming up pretty soon. I think that's everything, Jamie. All Thank right. Thank you so much for your time and expertise. Thank you. And I want you all to try working with some timelines and do some deed research. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. And I'm Take going to drop off and let you have your meeting. Wonderful. Thank Take you. care. Thank you, Jamie. Have a good night. Thank you. Bye-bye.